Thank you for attending tonight's meeting of the Westerville City Schools Board of Education. The agenda will be displayed on the screens in the front of the room. You may also follow along by connecting to the district's website, wcsoh.org. Click on the district link, then select Board of Education, then Board Docs Agenda, and select this evening's meeting. There will be two opportunities to address the board this evening, the first being agenda item 6.01. The first set of public comments is relative to agenda items 7.01 through 11.04. Please state the agenda items you are referencing at the beginning of your comments. The second opportunity is agenda item 12.01. There's a sign-up sheet located at the back of the room. Each speaker will have five minutes to address the board. And with that, Ms. Hendricks, will you please call the roll? Mr. Bird. Ms. Cotter? Here. Ms. Davison? Here. Dr. Nestor-Baker? Here. Mr. Villardo? Here. Will you please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? Sorry. It's okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 3.01, resolution for Westerville Education Challenge. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Would you please call the roll? Mr. Bird. Ms. Ms. Davison? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Blark? Yes. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to go over to the podium. There's a resolution. This is, this is just one of these very cool, uh, exciting things that we get to do to honor people in this district that go above and beyond, I would say way above and beyond. Uh, I will go to the podium. The rest of the board and Dr. Kellogg will stand in uh, front of the table here. Before I um, read the resolution, I would like all of the uh, Challenge Day ladies to please come forward and stand up here with me. <coughs> and you're going to read something in a minute, right? Sure. <laughs> okay? Yes. <laughs> all right. First of all, let me read this resolution. And again, as I mentioned just a second ago, um, we just get to honor people and groups that do amazing things throughout the district. And it's our privilege to read this resolution and to put it uh, officially uh, into the minutes um, of how we feel about what you have done. There's a resolution commemorating 10 years of Challenge Day programs in the Westerville City School District. Whereas at the urging of the Board of Education member Cindy Crow, Challenge Day in the Westerville City School District began December 2007. And whereas a total of 48 challenge days have been held in Westerville during the past 10 school years, involving approximately 5,000 students and 1,250 adult volunteers. And whereas post-program surveys indicate participants feel challenge day has been helpful to them in their personal lives, has made them feel more supportive of others has made them more aware of the effects of bullying and has made them feel more hopeful about their future. Has made them feel more hopeful about their future. And whereas the total cost of Challenge Day programs in the Westerville City School Districts has surpassed $190,000, which has been covered through generous grants, fundraisers, and donations from individuals, businesses, organizations, and families of student participants. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and the Superintendent commend all Challenge Day volunteers, donors, organizers, and participants 
for their part in helping to create a school community in Westerville where individuals are encouraged to treat each other with respect and acceptance. Be it further resolved that we extend a special note of recognition and thanks to the Westerville Education Challenge, an organization founded in 2009 for the purpose of sustaining Challenge Day initiatives and enhancing educational opportunities for students of our Westerville City Schools. Would you please thank these ladies? Uh, Dr. Kellogg and members of the bo school board, this is truly an honor to um, represent Challenge Day and receive this uh, resolution. Um, it has been an amazing decade of uh, work that so many people have put into it, and it's, it's a unique partnership that our whole community has embraced. It's not just the schools. It's, it's so many organizations, and um, we couldn't do it without all the different all the different people that have been a part of it over the years. Um, Westerville Education Challenge has become a, a true partner in this program, and it's amazing that we have a nonprofit group who starts up a grassroots initiative to try and support the programs that we're doing. Um, we knew that it wasn't something, it was something that we could not afford to pay for within the, the normal realm of our school district budget, and it probably never will be, and that's okay, because we have amazing, amazing community that has just come together. I could tell you story after story about different people who have, over the years, come with a little check for $35 to sponsor one kid, or, you know, a check for $1,300 to sponsor a whole class of kids, or, you know, Westerville Education Challenge that's given $35,000 to the program. So the Rotary Club helped us get it started, you know, 10 years ago, and it's just taken off. And so, so many people have been involved. Um, it's just too hard to try and name them all. But thank you to all these sisters of mine here that uh, have had a lot of fun, thrown some fundraisers over the years, and they continue to do that. Everybody's invited to an 80s party in February to help support Challenge Day <laughs> again, and um, it will be a great time. Everybody who comes to the party helps support one more kid coming to Challenge Day. By the way, um, a month ago, we planted one daffodil in honor of every kid that came to Challenge Day. We planted 5,000 daffodils around our high schools and our middle school. And next spring, when they're all blooming, if you see them, I want you to think of all the kids that came. And just like the daffodils are beautiful, and they come back year after year, our students are beautiful, and they keep coming back, and they are spreading kindness in their own little ways after they have gone to Challenge Day. And um, they're making an impact on our community, and those daffodils will be a reminder of that for many years to come. So anyway, that was a little partnership that happened as well. So anyway, it's been an amazing experience, amazing run, and I hope we can keep this going for another few decades. Thank you. I'm just going to say one more word about this. Um, I was driving back from Cincinnati. I was working in Cincinnati today. I was driving back, and I was thinking about this group and Challenge Day. And here, here's just just brief thought. Um, educating the mind is just so important, S so important to have a solid educational experience that, that, that I think we in our schools provide. Um, to touch the lives of the students at a deeper heart level, perhaps at a soul level, helps them to use that education 
with some compassion and some vision and strength. So united with the education that I believe we are providing, these challenge, day, these challenge days are trying to give a root of compassion and care and sensitivity. And in my estimation, in some of the brokenness we see in the world, if you bring together that education and that compassion, there might be some pretty powerful things that could happen. So thank you once again. Um, moving on, agenda item 4.01, approving the minutes from October 30 and November 8, 2017. We just ask if there are any questions or corrections. Hearing none at this time, moving on to um, a report 5.01, instructional coaches. I'm very excited to have this report. Uh, who is going to lay it out? Thank you, Barb. <laughs> Who's going to lay it out? Good evening, President Villardo, members of the board, and Dr. Kellogg. This evening, I have the pleasure of introducing to you a highly dedicated, hardworking group of professional educators, our elementary instructional coaches. Your support has enabled us to have a coach in every building, with the exception of Longfellow, Hamby, and Emerson, which share a coach. Our coaches provide embedded professional development to our teachers on an ongoing basis. Every Friday afternoon, this group gathers to study and improve their coaching practice and to increase their knowledge of curriculum and teaching methods. The energy they bring to our meetings is contagious. They meet new challenges with enthusiasm and work in their buildings to create positive learning environments. For the next few minutes, they'll share some of their work with you. I'm now going to have Brian Meyer and Sherry Chafin come up, and they're going to do our presentation. Brian, Sherry. Good evening. We are very excited to have this opportunity to share with you about the instructional coaching program in our elementary school buildings. Now, as a school district, our mission is to prepare students to contribute to the competitive and changing world in which we live. So with this top priority of educational excellence, we work together to establish goals to ensure student achievement. So there are district goals, there are building goals, there are teacher goals, and there are also student goals. This is where the instructional coach steps in. He or she is able to collaborate with our teachers to develop plans that will connect all of these goals to ultimately result in student learning. While there have been some amazing district coaches uh, supporting students and teachers throughout Westerville's history, the instructional coaching program has been developing over the last 10 years. And there have been four major phases in the development of the instructional coaching program. The first phase was in 2007 when the instructional coaching program was introduced to Westerville in six buildings. And then in 2011, our second phase began as we had a limited expansion of the coaches to other elementary buildings. In 2012 and 2013, the coaches' focus shifted to more of a district curriculum rather than just focusing on building needs. And since 2015, we are happy to report that each building has instructional coach support. So let's meet the instructional coaches uh, who came here this evening. Uh, from uh, representing Alcott Elementary is Marie Kimchi, who was unable to be here this evening. And then we have Ann Hurst. I'm Tanya Salisbury, and I've been teaching for 26 years, and I have three years of, um, this is my third year as an instructional coach. Representing Charrington Elementary. Hi, I'm Amy Hines. I have 24 years experience teaching, and I'm going on my third year of and representing Emerson. Erica Besh, thir uh, 13 years teaching and second year coaching. Representing Faust Elementary. Good evening, my name is Christina Volner. This is my 17th year in education and my eighth year as an instructional coach. And then we have Hamby. My name is Erica Besh. <laughs> <laughs> this is my 13th year teaching and second year coaching. <laughs> representing Hawthorne Elementary. And representing Huber Ridge. I'm Kristen Robertson. This is my 20th year of teaching and my fifth as an instructional coach. Representing Longfellow Elementary. 
Once again, I'm <laughs> this is my 13th year and my second year coaching. And representing Mark Twain. Hi, I'm Jerry Ann Patterson, and I have been teaching for 35 years, and the past nine years have been as a construction coach. Representing McVeigh Elementary. Hi, I'm Heather Smalley. This is my 13th year in education and my third year as an instruction coach. And then representing Point View. Representing Robert Frost Elementary. I am Sherry Chafin. This is my 18th year as an educator and my third year as an instructional coach. And then we have representing Whittier. Hello, I'm Kim Wickham. This is my 34th year in education and my eighth year as an instructional coach. And last, and I will say certainly least among these wonderful ladies, I am Brian Meyer. I've been in education for 18 years. I represent Wilder Elementary, and this is my going on my second year in instructional coaching. So you may ask, what exactly is instructional coaching? Now, Jim Knight, who is highly respected in the coaching world, he's done extensive research, would define instructional coaching as this. Instructional coaches partner with teachers to help them improve teaching and learning so students become more successful. So to do this, instructional coaches collaborate with teachers to first get a clear picture of current reality. So what this might look like is an instructional coach videotaping uh, students and teachers during teaching activities, might look like the instructional coach and teacher analyzing student data together, or might also look like the instructional coach observing teachers while they are teaching. And once this picture has become clear, the next step is for the teacher and the coach to work together in conference to identify goals to be focused upon. These goals could be anything from fine tuning classroom management to implementing uh, district curriculum materials or even looking at particular data to see how we can inform our instruction based on what that tells us. Next, the teachers and coaches will pick teaching strategies to meet the goals. So once again, during the conferencing period, they will brainstorm as a team to come up with the how, as in how the goals will be met. And then from this, this could lead to various activities such as modeling and co-teaching. And as we continue to look at the strategies, as we are in the classroom, the coach and the teacher continue to revisit the goals and analyze the data to see if those strategies are actually being effective. Finally, the teachers and coaches will problem solve until goals are met. So if the data suggests that the strategies aren't working, then they will pick new strategies until the goal is met. And when the goals are met, coaches move on to new coaching cycles. Now, believe it or not, not all coaching is equal. We have light coaching that involves tasks that support teachers, but don't necessarily change instructional practices. And then we have heavy coaching, on the other hand, which is defined as coaching heavy holds all adults responsible for student success and engages them as members of collaborative learning teams to learn, plan, reflect, analyze and revise their daily teaching practices based on student learning results. So our goal in our district is to provide heavy coaching through coaching cycles. What is that you say? A coaching cycle? <laughs> Let's learn a little bit more about a coaching cycle through this video. <laughs>
So, as you can see, the coaching cycle is a wonderful way to connect all of our goals to influence student achievement. So a district survey was given to teachers to elicit feedback on the impact of instructional coaching program. We are going to give you a few moments here. This uh, is a slide you should have seen earlier. <laughs> this is our light versus heavy coaching slide. This is called flexible coaching. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Now we'll move. There you go. Excellent. So based on this district survey, we're going to give you a few moments to read some of the responses we received from our actual teachers. Survey responses from the previous slide were based on the professional development provided by instructional coaches over the past 10 years. So we wanted to wrap up this presentation by sharing some of those professional <laughs> development opportunities that were afforded by the instructional coaches. If you could please press in the bell. So with that being said, are there any questions for us regarding the instructional coaching program? Who has some thoughts they'd like to share? I, I saw what you were doing, Nancy. Did you? Did you I did. You I, I'm thing? very impressed. I was thinking that too. 257 years of experience we're putting into play to provide professional development. Wow, how cool is that? It's not just the years, it's the people that make up those years. I love this program, and most of you know I love this program because what it does, it puts training and development exactly where it needs to be, and it takes our greatest asset, our people, and helps them become all that they want to be, can be, and need to be in today's educational world. I think it's some of, some of the best dollars that we spend uh, in order to provide the kind of service and the kind of development opportunities we're providing we need to invest in people, and this approach lets us do so at a much lower cost than we would if we decided other people knew better than we do. We know our stuff. We know what we need to do, and we know how to help people get where they want to be and need to be. And I thank you all for the work that you do. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard about the good stuff that happens in classrooms because of the work that you each do, specifically attributed to the work that you each do. So I want to thank you very much for all of those 257 years. Every one of them matters. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, kind of hokey. I just was thinking that um, 
and, and you all know this, you're the foundation, you know, just as you come up, and I so appreciate that. And, you know, I was kind of laughing as the Star Wars thing, because I'm like, and more, and more, and it's like out of this world, all that we expect, and you get to share and teach, and just how that grows. And so, thank you, thank you very much. You're amazing, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Great presentation. Mm -hmm. um, could we, I'm not sure where, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to see that, um, I'd like to see that PowerPoint somewhere so that people can see that. I don't know if that's on our website or, I, I just think there is a fundamental lack of knowledge about what instructional coaches do outside the schools. And so I, I just think it'd be a, a great tool for people to see. So, you know, what instructional coaches, you have them, what do you what do? You do? What, uh, I, I think that'd be a great thing. And I, I know uh, many of you and uh, love what you do. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we're really, we're just grateful. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation tonight, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so again. much. So, Mr. Valara, can I just offer a little something from, so um, those who know me know like the numbers thing, so here goes. <clears throat> um, under uh, Barb Wallace's leadership, who pushed very hard for us to allocate these resources and has spent a lot of time working with this team and our principals to work this program right, um, you understand that third grade reading guarantee was uh, part of what the state rolled out in terms of accountability several years ago. And just a reminder about results, because this is the team that has been very influential in terms of our results on, on, on that particular assessment, is that despite the fact that the state has increased the cut score for students each and every year, we continue to knock it out at 99% pass rate, which means we have almost all of our third graders coming through the system, some of whom didn't start with us in kindergarten meeting the third grade reading guarantee and avoiding the retention requirement on a third grade reading guarantee. That's a lot of families and a lot of young people. And then, so I think that's a, that's a big number to understand and, it, and I don't think it gets celebrated enough for us as a school district just how important that is. That's as important as graduation on the other end. The other one was anecdotally, um, I was in a principal meeting recently listening to some elementary school principals talk about um, their, their student performance over time and what they were saying to me was, because of this work and third grade reading guarantee work, um, they're feeling that as the kids come through that system and are, and are older um, in fourth and fifth grade, that we're starting to see those skill sets transcend years and those kids' abilities as they now have been in the system, a system that's been in place three years, right? So imagine a first grader who started out has now come through three years of, of the work that we're doing and where that student is now in their upper elementary years and where they're headed to moving on. So there's a, there's a longevity to this thing and some number pieces that are really important. I know that the elementary school principals, we talk a lot about resources, elementary schools. This might be one of the more important things we do. Barb puts a premium uh, and the principals will tell you, right? What, what's the number or what percentage of the time do they need to be in classrooms? And th so there's, <laughs> or, there's always this push to make sure this thing doesn't get away from us and go in the wrong direction and utilize what, f what sometimes can be viewed as um, free hands because they're not directly working with 25 kids six and a half hours a day and, and parcel that work out to some responsibilities that, that doesn't bring us the same value. So Barb pushes that, the principals live by that. These folks do great work, and um, I just want to thank them. And um, they know I've tended in past years to sit in on those Friday afternoon meetings. I've been absent this year. Um, that's not lack of confidence. It's just busyness with other things. But it is, um, what I've said it before, one of my most favorable district meetings to sit in because I learn a lot about elementary literacy and elementary instruction when I sit in. So thank you to all of them for taking this commitment. Thank you. Um, moving on to agenda item 6.01, public comments related to action items. We have no one signed up this evening. Uh, 7.01 agenda item, motion to approve the financial reports, investments, October 2017. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you very much. Do you have anything to share with us? Um, Mr. President, members of the board, I'd just like to say we've presented October 2017's financials, general fund only year-to-date receipts are 78.7 million, year-to-date expenditures for general fund 58.4 million, 
at October 31st, that left us with an unencumbered fund balance of 106,554,000. All funds year-to-date receipts are 97.7 million. Year-to-date expenditures, 73.4 million. A total unencumbered fund balance of 128,990,000. Thank you very much, Ms. Hendricks. Any questions or comments? Would you please call the roll? Mr. Bird? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Ms. Davison? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Florido? Yes. Agenda item 7.02, resolution to approve the fund to fund transfer from Capital Improvement Fund 003 to Debt Service Fund 002 in the amount of 2.9 million and from General Fund 0001, 001 to the Turf Replacement Fund 009004 in the amount of 65 thousand dollars may I have a motion and a second so moved second thank you very much any questions or comments on that anything to add to that separate straightforward our annual uh, transfers uh, from the capital fund to the bond fund to pay for the TAN payments okay. uh, for the tax anticipation notes and our annual uh, fund the fund for the turf replacement uh, prior to this transfer, the fund was just at under $400,000, so this will put us at about $465,000 for those future replacements of the turf fields. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, please call the roll. Mrs. Cotter? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Mrs. Davison? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Moving on to agenda item 8, personnel consent agenda. Um, 8.01 through, I would like to take out 8.08 .08 and consider it separately. So I'd like for us to consider 8.01 through 8.07 if there is no objection to that. So moved. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please call the roll on that. Second. second it. I was going to say, there we second go. I'll second it. <laughs> Ms. Cotter? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Bird? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. So a motion for 8.01, 8.07. You're going to address those, right? May I have a motion and a second just for those then? So moved. Second. Mr. Bird? Yes. Mrs. Cotter? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. The first motion was to consider it separately. The second <laughs> motion was to approve it. And, you know, last meeting, you all were, like, really quick on these motions and seconds, and tonight you're a little slower. <laughs> we'll we wanted it to up. give you a chance we'll to it keep up. up. It, it, oh, keep up with you. Oh, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Feel in the love. Would you uh, rescue me this, for this, please? Good evening, President Villardo, members of the board. Tonight's consent agenda contains eight sections involving 79 persons. Section 8.01 is the resignation of three classified employees and five substitutes. 8.02 is a leave of absence for two classified employees. 8.03 is the contractual status change for six classified employees. 8.04 is a change of assignment for one classified employee and one amended end date from a previously approved item. 8.05 is a one-time payment for seven teachers. 8.06 is the employment of 10 classified employees and three substitutes. 8.07 is the employment of one teacher, 11 athletic events assistants, seven supplemental contracts, two outside supplementals, and one amended item from a previously approved item, agenda. And 8.08 .08 is the disability retirement of one classified administrator. Are there any questions, comments on 8.01 through 8.07? Hearing none, would you please call the roll? Mr. Bird? Yes. Ms. Cotter? Yes. Ms. Davidson? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. We will now look at 8.08, .08, disability retirement for a classified administrator. <clears throat> May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. And I want to take the time for any board members to address, but I, um, uh, this is for the retirement of our um, treasurer, uh, William Bart Griffith. And I have a letter to read from him to the community, but first wanted to ask if the community 
uh, if the board would like to share any thoughts. First. You're going to cry. Or we're going to make fun of him. Or we're going to make fun of him. <laughs> this, group, this group is cold. <laughs> this is a letter, as I said, uh, from the Board of Education, from the staff, um, and, and the community from uh, Bart Griffith. Dear Board of Education, staff, and community, six years ago, you placed your trust in me as a financial leader to help you through a difficult time. I have tried to live up to that trust every day. Over these past years, I have tried to educate our directors, principals, staff, and community about school funding and its impact on district finances. I have also worked diligently to help everyone understand what we had to do as a team to develop and maintain financial stability for the district. When you look at our finances today, it seems that our collective efforts have paid off. Past and present board members, Dr. Kellogg, staff and community have all been awesome to work with. It has been a pleasure serving you. As you know, I have been dealing with a lot of serious health issues these past several years. It has become more and more difficult to work through my health issues while working at a high level for the district. This past July, I applied to the schools, to the school employees retirement system for disability retirement. Therefore, I must apply for disability retirement from the Westerville City School District effective January 1, 2018. My last day will be December 31, 2017. Please accept this letter as my request for disability retirement and please know that it has been an honor serving all of you. You will be missed. Sincerely, Bart Griffith. I mean, I'd just like to say that um, it's been a pleasure working with Bart. I've been the finance liaison this year, and um, his professionalism, as well as his um, desire to really look at ways to save the district money but still provide an excellent service for the community has been inspiring to me. Um, I think I will definitely miss working with him, and of course, we all wish him well. Um, but it really has been a pleasure working with him since I've been on the board and especially as finance uh, liaison. So thanks, Bart. We'll be thinking about you. Bart would chase after 100 bucks as much as he would chase after 100 million. I don't think I have ever known a finer treasurer. See, I am going to cry. Mm -hmm. Did not expect that. Bart is a consummate professional. And every day he gave everything he had to this district. I will miss him deeply. When, uh, when I was actually interviewing uh, to be appointed to the board, I had a number of friends that were um, deeply involved in uh, the Ohio education community. And one of them I sat down for coffee with and just kind of said, you know, what do I need to understand? What do I need to watch for? And he says, you don't need to watch out for much. He says, you have one of the Griffith brothers. Um, many people in the community may not know um, Bart's a twin, and, and his twin brother is also a treasurer. Um, and it's, it's an interesting combination, I think, um, because um, not just the, the family dynamic, but the fact that um, as treasurers, they're, they're almost legendary in the state of Ohio. Um, and, and I think people may not really appreciate that fact, that, that we had in our midst a treasurer that is really seen uh, as uh, one of the best in the state. Um, I think that his results clearly show that. Um, I have said this time and time again. Um, when people look at fiscal health, whether it's personal 
uh, professional or corporate, um, one of the biggest hallmarks of that is what type of rating do the agencies give you? And three times, I believe, since BART has joined uh, this district, um, our, our ratings have been elevated with Moody's and other uh, ratings agencies. That doesn't happen because they like your treasurer. That happens because you are believed to be a reliable asset from a financial standpoint. And, and a large part of that um, credit goes to BART and his leadership and to his staff and to the support that he received from this administration. Um, so uh, it, losing BART is difficult. Um, it's difficult for me. I have thoroughly enjoyed working with him. It's great to come across people that are really, really technically proficient, which BART is. Um, what I find um, uh, even more compelling about uh, Bart is his character and his integrity. Um, he's just he's one of the finest people I've worked with. The financial stuff and the work stuff aside, um, you know, I stepped in the district pretty soon after Bart did, and we, um, one of the interesting dynamics of a school district is the fact that the treasurer doesn't work for the superintendent, the superintendent doesn't work for the treasurer, we both work for the board. And that, in some places, can make the, the relationship awkward. And for Bart and I, um, there, beyond the professional side, there was just a personal relationship, a friendship that formed pretty easily and pretty smoothly. Just, he's just a good guy. And um, I, I think, um, uh, for me, uh, in my first superintendency, um, that was really critical to be next to someone who had been in schools, new schools, new school finance, was patient with me as I learned things, helped me understand things, corrected me when I needed it, and supported me when I needed it. Um, we used to joke it was uh, he's, he would make the money and I was supposed to spend the money. Um, and the relationship um, um, formed. And, uh, it will be one of those professional relationships that became personal that will remain with me for a long, long time. And so um, I fully intend on tweeting him on a regular basis about his Cleveland Browns. <laughs> and I'm sure he will send me messages on a regular basis about my Philadelphia Eagles, although I'm winning this year. Um, and look forward to Browns, seeing. That's a given. Yeah, I know. 16 ways to lose a season. Um, I, I look forward to hearing from him um, in his personal life. He has great family that he uh, takes care of. He has uh, 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 lots of uh, endeavors in his world that he's going to continue exploring and being part of from sitting on the lake with his boat to taking care of his grandchildren um, and, his, and his family. And I know that was a big part of the measuring about this decision was he knew um, he enjoys that part and so we'll miss him here we will carry on and um and and be bart like in all the things we can and that might be a way new, new way to do things be bart like in all things we can so i also want to thank laura for uh stepping in um i know a little premature for the evening but um she's a a, a gem for what she does and what she's going to do for us moving forward into that whole department so um a little, a little different right now Thank you to him for all of his work. So I'm not going to repeat what everyone said because he really is amazing and he was our friend. Um, but I just wish him a long, happy, healthy life. And and we're going to keep keep in touch, all of us. So I really would echo all the all the comments. Um, and I'm, I'm sure Bart will be uh, watching this video. <laughs> and so I, I just want to explain to him that I'll be voting no on this. <laughs> And uh, no, he's uh, it's just been very helpful to me. I'll just speak personally. He's been very helpful to me in just understanding the whole um, um, diabolical morass of uh, school funding. And that's I, I just uh, he's just been very helpful. And, and anytime he's just always saying, if you've got questions, just come just let me know. And so that's kind of uh, he, he's our uh, financial instructional coach. <laughs> I uh, really he is. I mean, he just he just makes some things very plain that are not plain, my friends, in the in the uh, financial world of school funding. Uh, so just a good guy. 
and at, at, at the last time I saw him, uh, just uh, was in his office and, and just went in and talked to him for a few minutes, and uh, I, gave him a, I gave him a hug, uh, which always shocks him when I hug him. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's give him a hug, and I said, I'm, I'm just going to be praying for you. And, and I think he was just glad to hear that uh, we will be praying for him and, uh, and uh, valuing who he is. And I echo, just hope he's got some great many days ahead with the grandkids out on the boat. Um, and if he's still watching, um, he hasn't taken me out on the boat yet. I just want to say that up there. I should stop now, shouldn't I? You should stop I now. should stop, stop now. now. Should have stopped five minutes ago. Uh, we've, we've done a motion in a second already, right? Uh, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Davison. Yes. Mrs. Cotter. Yes. Mr. Bird. Yes. Dr. Mr. Baker. Yes. Mr. Villardo. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your words, I know. Uh, moving on to agenda item 9.01, policy 2271 College Credit Plus. Um, this is uh, recommended action, old business. We need a uh, motion and a second for this. So if I could have a motion and a second. So, so moved. <laughs> all right. Second. Uh, Take your pick, whoever, oh, first and second. And are we going to, any any thoughts on this? Because we've gone through this already. Anybody, questions, any concerns? Okay, would you please call the roll? Mr. Bird. Yes. Mrs. Davidson. Oh, Mr. Dr. Nestor Baker. Sorry. Yes. Mr. Cotter. Yes. Mrs. A. Davidson. Yes. Mr. Villardo. Yes. And I just want to remind everybody out there, when we go through something like that, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been on our agenda already. We have read through it. We've asked questions. Just don't want you to think we're just like passing things through. That's a recommended old action. That's, that's a previous action. Uh, agenda item 10, recommended action, new business. This is a first reading, 1001. First reading, the addition of statistics, trigonometry, and functions course of study, and the removal of pre-college mathematics course of study. Are there any, yes, you, you are gonna talk about this, right? Yes, would you like to? President Villardo. Yes. President Villardo. Yes. Before we proceed, if I could, um, Take just a moment. I uh, want to explain my upcoming absence. Um, I'll need to uh, excuse myself from uh, session. Uh, part of the um, fun of being a uh, an only parent for a senior in high school, I have to go to a senior awards recognition this evening. So uh, my apologies to uh, those here with us this evening in the community that I need to excuse myself early. No, thank you. Thank you for letting us know. That's important. That's very important. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening and thank you scoot this up a little bit maybe. Uh, adding statistics, trigonometry, and functions, and yes, that's the name of one course, uh, to existing math course offerings will expand opportunities for students to become college ready. This course will primarily serve seniors who have successfully completed Algebra 2 Essentials. This is the first year for our Algebra 2 Essentials course, so this would be the course that the students who are in this course, would, the Algebra 2 course would take next year. Uh, this is not for someone who is intending to be a math major in, high, in college, but virtually all college majors include a statistics component, and this course will lay the groundwork for success in that course. Years ago, we had a FST course. Uh, it was removed kind of in an unusual, unusual situation because we were going to state minimums, and state minimum is for years of math and that was a semester course so it didn't necessarily make sense because it didn't meet the you're not gonna make me dance right okay uh, it didn't meet you know those state minimums so we moved we removed it at the time for that purpose um, with the change of the standards with what we are seeing in statistics that is one of the reasons why it was not renamed FST although that's much easier off the tongue uh -huh. uh, than starting it's just going to kind of be called stats probably you know what it will uh, come to but it was very important to the committee to put that name first because that was the the chunk of the course was the statistics course several years ago um, we began transitioning away from what we call the integrated track. We, have, we had integrated A, B, integrated math topics, and pre-college math. 
So beginning in the 10-11 school year, we began to phase those out. Um, based on the comfort level of our teachers and what our students needed, we kept pre-college math, uh, knowing that we would work to move through the courses uh, to replace that eventually, and that time has come. We just have maybe one or two sections at each of our buildings of that course, and this would serve to replace that course. Are there questions? And we have Michael Hewler, who he was the heavy side person with the Brown statement earlier, uh, <laughs> for those of you that noticed that, and some other committee members as well. I'm sorry, Jen, I missed, what did you say was be was, would be phased out? The course is called pre-college mathematics. Okay, that's okay. Is the because this is very helpful for me. Is is pre-college mathematics um, a th that's a a twelfth grade? Yes. Th okay. Mm -hmm. It's a fourth year course. So the requirements, as you know, are um, four years and yeah. algebra two. So that fourth course has been you know pretty much kind of whatever we would want it to be. There is not that same requirement once a student passes Algebra two, But a lot of what is in Algebra two Essentials is within that pre-college math course. So it's, you know, it's, it's phased out. Okay. And the, the, um, um, the, I'm sorry, the pre-college mathematics that is being mm -hmm. phased out, mm -hmm. replaced by this long titled class, yes. <laughs> um, right? Mm -hmm. like, right, this class, uh, I like a lot, I think I'm just pointing this out, I like a lot, I think you're saying that this will provide some root system to statistics, maybe not a, you know, a yes. hardcore kind of statistics, right. but as they go into college, mm -hmm. they'll be a little more comfortable with their first foray into statistics, they'll have some sense of, basis there already and I I think we're hearing Dr. Mm -hmm. Kellogg I know you've mentioned this before statistics being just like a really important right mm -hmm. okay I, I just wanted to point that, that I thought that mm -hmm. that's that's really good we have talked about that up yes. here mm -hmm. and and I and I like um, are there any other advantages you don't have to go into a lot of detail are there any other advantages benefits strengths to this course that is replacing pre-college mathematics. I Anything else you would highlight other than the stats one? Michael Hewler? <laughs> Come on, this is really, Sherry, I feel like, like oh, sorry. I don't, I think that that's Go ahead. Um, <laughs> the pre-college math is, a lot of that has been absorbed by the um, Algebra Two Essentials class, so it's a, a, a mismatch with content. The pre-college math, they would be coming in with a lot of that and this is the next continuation. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's, well, there's, there's another piece to that. So listen to what he just said. Because mm -hmm. the standards for math in Ohio have just gone up. Mm -hmm. And we just ratchet, and, and so this is ratcheting up even a little bit more. So now it's four years of math, inclusive of Algebra 2. Uh, old people like me remember when math, Algebra 2 was not required. Um, and then Mike said that uh, what we had in the pre-college math has been embedded in our Algebra 2 essentials, which used to be a senior year exit course. Mm -hmm. And now we have this new course on top of that, fourth year math, which is a statistics trig course and function course. The other advantage, um, not real clear to everybody, but on a college or a transcript to a college application, pre-college math is this amorphous thing. Statistics, trigonometry, and functions is very concrete about what math that student has accomplished and makes sense. So, yes, and I've I've taken up the preaching about statistics as a more important math across the board for kids beyond calculus is important. Statistics is across the board much more, much more prevalent in in all kinds of industries and in the world we're talking about when we think about STEM and where we're going in the world. This is critical stuff. So I know Mike and the math teachers put a lot of work into this. I think they've created a really nice pathway for our kids to make sure that um, we're not going to fear higher level math. We're going to embrace higher level math. One of the outcomes of our math program and the change in graduation requirements is we have more kids completing higher level math than ever before. Infinitely, just exponentially more kids of taking higher level math. Um, than ever before in our district, and that's a good thing. Um, right, Mike? <laughs> and, well, and I want to just take a second because 
the point that we've made about statistics and statistical analysis over the last few years, Dr. Kellogg and I have talked about that since I joined the board. Um, I have the corporate perspective on this. It is the single lacking skill that is defining in the job workforce in America right now. Statistics is, it, what's fascinating to me is, is that I have never used geometry since I graduated from college. I use statistics every single day, all right? I just, I, I don't, I mean, I just rely on other people to cut the wood and make sure that the angles are correct. I really, really do. Mm -hmm. But statistics, <laughs> that, that's not saying we want to get rid of geometry. He's no, not saying, not saying. that. <laughs> but the, the reality is, is that risk and probabilities and deviations and, and that mm -hmm. set of mathematics is what drives uh, information technology. It's what drives information security, cybersecurity. It's what drives risk management and actuarial science. And yet it has been a big, big hole in curriculum um, at the high school level. Mm -hmm. So I'm always enthusiastic when we bring this forward. Um, and, and I'm happy that, uh, so maybe I should have said, I use statistics way more than I use geometry on a day-to-day -day -day basis. That's yeah. better, that's better. <laughs> I have never used calculus on a day-to-day -day basis, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Dr. Nestor Baker is gonna bail him out. Right? <laughs> Actually, no, I'm just gonna go in a different direction. No. His hole is so deep, I can't dig him out of it. Um, I wanna go at the stats argument in a little different way. Yeah, it's really important for STEAM, and it's important in the corporate world, but I have come to believe that a strong understanding of stats is a requirement in our current day and age in order to keep our republic alive. I have decided that without the knowledge of stats, people are sheep led to slaughter because there is so much out there and so many people selling so many different agendas that unless you know what you're reading, you can be led astray very, very quickly. So I was extremely concerned when we did away with that stats course years ago mm -hmm. uh, because, well, obviously, I think it really matters. And to bring it back, and to bring it back within this particular context makes very good sense to me. I like to see this happening, and I hope uh, to see a day when we see stats infusing across the disciplines mm -hmm. because stats, like geometry, matters across all the disciplines. So this, this is a good step, this is an important mm -hmm. step, and this fills a significant gap that we had. I do have two quick items to note. This is not only aligned to um, Ohio's learning standards, but also to the ACT standards. So know that that is something when we look at our upper level courses that no longer have the same requirements of those that are our tested areas, that we have taken an additional step the team has taken an additional step to align to those ACT standards, which um, was also relayed in our 11th and 12th grade ELA courses last year when we brought those to you. Um, and just another item to note, for those who are more serious about statistics, uh, this year we added, so we are in the first year of implementation of AP statistics. So we have that one on the books as well. Tremendous. Um, I, I know what you can name this course, if I, if I may be so bold. You may. Fund with stats and trig. Oh, what do you think, folks? Uh, it's <laughs> I don't it's better than down with geometry, isn't Mixed it? Mixed reactions. <laughs> okay, Richard More wants comments. to vote on this one. Any other comments or no questions? No We're voting. not voting on it? No, first week. No. But he really wants to vote on this one. <laughs> nope. you know, I didn't see this group as excited as when we did uh, preschool. We, we, you, you almost went through a full vote with the puppets, I'm, if you I'm recall. Right, so, right. And you didn't bring puppets tonight. I did not. Do, uh, the teachers have, do you all have anything that you would like to say, anything that you want us to pay very close attention to, anything you're particularly proud of or concerned about that we should know about? They're thinking about the title of the class. Yeah, they just, are. Yeah, they're, they're going with it, Rick. I, I can feel it. Okay. Okay, we should probably move on. Ye yes, <laughs> d yes. Oh. Yes, sir. I just want to thank my committee members. They worked really hard on this, and it was a pleasure to do. They were really good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. 
Uh, agenda item 10.02, first reading, addition of AP Physics 1 to Science curriculum. Yes, thank you. Uh, we continue to work to expand our AP offerings, and we're excited to propose AP Physics 1 for, the, for next school year. Westerville has traditionally offered Honors Physics as a first year course, and AP Physics C, and AP Physics 2 as a second full year course. And really, the difference there is we have uh, C offered at two of our buildings and two offered at one. Uh, it's, it's really based on um, enrollment in that AP Physics 2 aligns very closely with IB Physics, which is why the, the course um, has grown there when it comes to that second year requirement, um, or second year opportunity, I should say. No one's required to take AP Physics. Didn't don't let me misspeak. Uh, AP Physics 1 is intended to be that first year physics course taught at an advanced level. It's equivalent to the first semester of an introductory college course and is algebra based. Uh, it expands opportunities for students to earn AP credit and uh, it's an additional AP science course, but this has a reduced emphasis in calculus, as Mr. Bird referenced, he has not used calculus, uh, which makes this mu much more accessible to students. And then they could choose to move on to AP Physics 2 or AP Physics C. Those are two courses uh, in physics that we currently have on the books. Several years ago, AP went through sort of a shift, uh, and that's when one and two came on. So we're adjusting to what the College Board has done as well. So this will be another, you know, kind of in closing, this is another AP opportunity for our students that we haven't had previously. And AP Physics 1, mm -hmm. uh, full year. Yes. AP Physics 2. Full year. It's full year. Mm -hmm. AP Physics C. Yes, you could take those. And honestly, there's, there's even more AP Physics courses. Uh, usually schools or districts don't choose to offer more than a few. Uh, so we would have one and then two or C as those second year courses. C is pretty specific around um, mechanics. C is also a year. Two. Mm -hmm. Yes. C is also a year-long course. Yes, they're all three year-long courses. That's correct. Right. Okay. Yes. I just, all AP courses are year-long. I, I, I thought I wanted to make sure. Thank you. Good clarification. Thank you. So as this is added, is anything mm -hmm. else taken away? <clears throat> Nothing is taken away. Um, we do feel that students would have an opportunity to select between Honors Physics and AP Physics 1. As we looked through uh, the alignment of the courses, it does align very, very closely. So that would be uh, a communication piece for us in helping students to make the right choice. Why would a student choose Honors Physics instead of AP? That would be a harder argument for me. Um, I think it would be a comfort level or an, it, knowing um, AP is a little daunting. So I think we would have to really uh, help our students understand that there will be support available and that it is something that is truly attainable. Um, you know, some students will say, I'm, I'm a little more worried about my GPA. And then I think as uh, Dr. Kellogg mentioned earlier, when you're looking at pre-college math on your transcript, as opposed to an AP, AP course, and how much better that in the long term will look for you as you uh, look at colleges. So um, I do think it's it's a kind of a mind shift for students, uh, but I think that we are doing some great things in our high schools to keep preparing students more for this challenging coursework. I think um, on, at the building level with the principals, um, this issue of the honors versus the AP mm -hmm. is a great one as we continue to emphasize the students and trying to attract more students to AP tracked and so um, this gives them the opportunity to continue that conversation with kids and their parents and Jen hit the nail on the head when she talked about and I think you were getting the same thing well what is honors and what is AP um, sometimes it's the test which they're not required to take there's no harm in taking it no one's gonna hold you back if you don't like your score you don't send it in um, so it, 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 I think it's gonna be um, Interesting to see how the enrollment patterns go, the honors versus the AP as we move down this path, but um, it's a good opportunity. Yeah, it is, and I'm gonna go out a little bit on a limb here, limb here since this isn't quite the direction we're going this evening. Um, given how closely honors tracks with the AP physics course, uh, I would hope that in years to come that we phase the honors piece out because to me it feels almost um, 
almost unnecessary given how close the courses are. You know, and I, like I say, I, I'm kind of going out on that, and maybe I don't have uh, enough of an understanding to say that, but I think I do. And I'm not saying do it now, but I'm saying in years to come, as we look at our finite FTE, um, and we look at how we're staffing across our departments in the high schools, then we need to be looking at which courses seem to be very much near, uh, not complete mirrors, but near mirrors of other courses. And identify, Jen, as you were talking about, what keeps students from taking one course in favor of another course that is so highly similar. Mm -hmm. So it's just something I want to see us really looking at as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Where are these courses, whether it's physics or elsewhere, where are these courses that track so closely to a different course and how do we look at those within the context of student need and teacher FTE? And I would say as you look at those, feedback, which I know Nancy is thinking in her head, but we haven't said out loud, we want feedback from the teachers to see oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, exactly what their thoughts are. Mm -hmm. um, because even though it may look the same on paper, to them maybe the way they deliver it, it's, it's totally different. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of conversations with um, our physics teachers even uh, as late as early this month in talking through that transition. And, and I would say that some um, would say, yep, we're ready, let's just go all in. AP mm -hmm. Physics 1, others um, were more trepidatious, and so we wanted to be cognizant of that and um, for the time, and maybe in the foreseeable future, as you men mentioned, Dr. Nestor Baker, um, but to have that dual opportunity for right now as as we move through that. But yes, they've um, been very vocal in their feedback, and, and this is uh, something that they are extremely comfortable with. Um, I would like to add on to that, um, to, um, Dr. Nestor Baker and Mrs. Davidson's comments, I think those are really appropriate. But I'd also like you, if you're going to consider um, a l transitioning away from honors physics to get some student feedback mm -hmm. on honors and AP classes to see what their input is on that and what the differences are from their perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you. And I will, uh, I, that is great feedback. I will say from our lead hire grant, we are getting some of that student feedback on the difference, I think definitely drilling into AP physics would be, uh, and honors physics would be time well spent, but know that we do have a lot of great data um, that that company is providing to us to help us make decisions. Great, great, that's a great discussion to have. Thank mm -hmm. you for everyone. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Jen, thank you for sharing and, and moving forward on some very important coursework. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, agenda item 11.01, uh, looking at donations. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Any thoughts or comments from fellow board members? Just thankful as always. Yeah, we are just tremendously grateful for the, the support we get from the community, uh, individuals, groups. Um, and uh, year to date, it is uh, over $70,000. And that is a huge, we believe, a huge stamp of support from folks all around the district. Again, sometimes it's individuals, sometimes it's families, sometimes it's PTAs. Um, we're just very grateful. So thank you. Uh, let's call the roll. Ms. Cotter. Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes. Mr. Berg. Ms. Davison. Yes. Mr. Villardo. Yes. Agenda item 11.02, resolution to approve Julie A. Mujic to the Library Board of Trustees to complete a term on the Westerville Public, Lord, uh, Public Library Board of Trustees to begin January 1, 2018, expire December 31, 2025. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. A second. This is to fulfill our joint connection with the library to uh, work with them, appoint someone to their board of trustees. This has been done for how many years now, would you say? Well, uh, ever since the library became a school district library. Okay. So that's, uh, it's necessary that we do that, that approval. So Thank we've you. We've been doing it for a very long time. Thank you very much. Any questions, comments? 
Please call the roll. Ms. Davidson. Yes. Ms. Cotter. Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes. Mr. Villardo. Yes. 11.03 Ohio Health Agreements. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you very much. Mr. Hershiser, I believe, is going to share with us this evening. Thank you, President Villardo. Members of the board, Dr. Kellogg. Tonight's Ohio Health Agreements include both our athletic training agreement and our health care collaboration agreement. Both of these agreements have one year remaining on them <coughs> after this current year. Uh, in addition to everything that we have been accustomed to with our agreements with Ohio Health, everything from our enrollment center, physicals for our students, um, different programs for our coaches, uh, by extending these agreements for an additional five years, we are able to add athletic training for lacrosse, which is, as you know, a varsity sport this year. Uh, we will also be able to keep our athletic training uh, cost the same from 2007 through 2024. So with all of the, we asked Ohio Health to open these up with lacrosse being added. And with that, we'll be able to go 17 years without any additional cost. So that, that's a pretty big deal, especially when health care costs and the different things that we know that we're experiencing. Um, and, I'm sorry. In addition to all of the current sponsorship agreements that we have, these agreements will also now provide an additional $8,000 for our middle schools and an additional 1,000 hours of athletic training for our middle schools. Having had the opportunity to be a part of our partnership with Ohio Health since its inception, I would like to thank Ohio Health and also Bill Davis, who is here from Ohio Health tonight, for the strong partnership and the ongoing support that they've given us. It's that's tremendous, Mr. Davis. Would you do? Do you want to say a word to the, our vast uh, television audience uh, this <laughs> evening? Or <coughs> you you are welcome too, it, it, but you don't have to. Okay. Uh. Okay. <laughs> well, well, thank you for being here tonight. And I, you know, if you go from uh, 2007 to what is it, 2025? 2024. 2024. Let's go to 2025. Uh, and no increase, and I, I personally uh, am very excited about the inclusion of lacrosse with no additional cost, and I, I'm very excited about uh, the opportunities afforded to the middle schools. Mm -hmm. um, we are kind of hot and heavy right now, focusing on uh, middle schools and, and trying to do some really powerful um, things with and through them, and so you're a part of that. Uh, so thank you to Ohio Health. I, I don't want to, do any other board members want to share some thoughts? Um, I wondered, I was kind of giving you a chance to thank get you. a drink of water. This is a significant return on investment for us. Maybe Bill doesn't know how great a return on investment it is. So No, but I wondered if you would speak a little bit to the return on investment, because it's it's phenomenal for the district. Yeah, the the different parts of it, and we've split it off. We done it a few different ways over the years and we have split off with the athletic training component and then as I said the healthcare collaboration component and when, when you look at the enrollment center alone uh, approximately 2100 square feet for a dollar a year uh, when you look at the informational folders that our enrollment center provides to families that Ohio Health provides for us um, there, there are so many things that we have in the contract that have a financial value to the district, but I think in addition to that, it's the partnership and always being willing to help, always stepping up, never being, I, I've never had a conversation with them in the 17 years that we've been working, or at this point, 10 years that we've been working with them, where they've said no. Um, and, it, and that's above and beyond the, the contract. From a financial standpoint for us, since 2007, we have paid, $15,000 per high school for athletic training services. And that hasn't gone up, um, not a penny. The only change that we had is when we added Central, it was an additional building, but they kept that same price intact for that. 
Uh, in addition to that, Ohio Health, they sponsor our inter-district inter games, inter-district games. So each school gets financial, um, the four thousand. well, I'll just say $4,000 per team per year. That's in addition to the 8,000 that they're now gonna do with the middle school. Um, the, the coaching and the, the different things that, that they do, uh, the, the pre-participation physicals, mm -hmm. where our boosters oftentimes run that as a fundraiser, and so the money goes back into the schools. Ohio Health does that at no cost. Um, the PAP coaches clinics, the CPR AED uh, training that they do, they work with us, or offer to work with us on some curriculum. They do impact testing for concussions. Um, they provide other, all of their healthcare professionals are available to us and our athletes get uh, preference. So you, if there's an injury, they get in immediately. This is a phenomenal partnership. And I can't thank Ohio Health enough for the remarkable public citizenship that you show in working through this contract and continuing to work with us and going so far above and beyond the contract. I am continually amazed by your role with this school district and by the success of that role with the school district. I hope that we continue to be close friends and close partners far beyond this particular contract's length. So thank you very much to Ohio Health and Mark, thank you very much for all the work that you've done for all these years on this particular contract. This is, this is important work and it's important in its scope and it's important in its level of connection between the two entities. I, you know, I, I echo that. I mean, it is an amazing partnership that we truly value and we thank you for keeping our kiddos safe and being there and we consider you family, so thank you. I, I um, just final word and I, I would say this to you and I would ask you to take it back to the people in your office and just simply say that uh, if you have a child who's injured playing, it really does matter that somebody is there to try and care for them. That is not inconsequential. And you are helping to provide that. So thank you. Any other thoughts? Please call the roll. Thank you, Mark. Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes. Ms. Cotter. Yes. Ms. Davison. Yes. Mr. Villardo. Yes, moving on to agenda item 11.04, resolution for pro tem treasurer. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. I, I feel like I should read this resolution. Is that all right? I think it's a good idea. Is yeah, that, I think okay, so too. thank you. That's nice. Thank you. Uh, resolution. Whereas the current treasurer is on approved leave of absence and is unable to perform the daily duties and responsibilities of the office of treasurer, and whereas the Board of Education desires to appoint a temporary treasurer to fulfill the daily duties and responsibilities of the office of treasurer until such time as the current treasurer is able to resume those duties or the current treasurer resigns, retires. Thank you. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Westerville City School District determines that the current treasurer is incapacitated in such a manner that he is unable to perform the duties of the office of treasurer as provided in Ohio Revised Code Section 3313.23 and be it further resolved that in a majority vote of the members of the board hereby appoint Ms. Laura Hendricks, Assistant Treasurer, at an additional 150 per diem, effective November 20, 2017, to serve as Treasurer pro tempore until such time as the current Treasurer returns to work, the current Treasurer's contract of employment with the district expires, the current Treasurer resigns, retires, or until the treasurer pro tempore is removed. That is the motion before us. We have a motion and a second already. Uh, any other thoughts to that? I believe none. Just Laura, thank you for taking this on. We're just, we're so grateful. Yeah. We are. Mm -hmm. Let the hazing yes, begin. Are. Yeah, I thought we all should move and all should second everything and just you know really start you off right. <laughs> so bad. Would you, would you please call the roll? 
Ms. Cotter? Yes. Ms. Davison? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Villardo? Yes. Moving on, agenda item 12.01, public comments. We have no one signed up this evening. Uh, agenda item 13.01, uh, board brief comments. Do we have any comments that we would like to add? Say? Yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to go back to Challenge Day for a minute. Uh, my son was able to participate in Challenge Day this year, and it was really a positive experience. So I just wanted to, you know, express my thanks again for everything that you all are doing for Challenge Day and how much it really helps the students in high school in a difficult time in many of their lives. So thank you again. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 14.01, the board will meet in regular session Monday, December 11, 2017, here at the Early Learning Center, 6 o'clock. And now I would like to ask for a motion to go into executive session. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. <laughs> second. And just to let you know, before we take this vote, we will go into executive session and we will adjourn from there. We will not be coming back into this room. So I will say thank you to all who have been here with us tonight supporting. I know the coaches. Thank you, Ohio Health, and thank you for all of you staying with this meeting. This is one of our best crowds we've had. Yeah. <laughs> Come back. I, I don't know if it was the snacks or it was the cake. We finally. Okay, we better we better vote because they're leaving now. Uh, may I have uh, please call the roll? Ms. Cotter. Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker. Yes. Ms. Davison. Yes. Mr. Villardo. Yes. We will go into executive session. Thank you all very much. Yikes. We are in so. I don't know.